Okay, this is going to be kind of a super fast review of pretty much everything we've talked about this semester um, in preparation for our semester exam. Um, I'm going to start off with the chemistry unit, and then we'll move from chemistry to biology, and then from biology to physics. So starting off real quick with chemistry, we've got uh, atomic structure. We know that atoms are made of three main particles, and those particles are protons, neutrons, and electrons. So atoms are made of those three things. Protons have a positive charge. Neutrons have a neutral charge or a charge of zero, no charge, not positive or negative. And the electrons have a negative charge. As far as mass goes, protons have a mass of 1 AMU, so that counts. The neutrons have a mass of 1 AMU, which also is important. And then electrons are so small that they have a mass of about 0 AMU, so we just don't count them toward mass. Location, protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus of the atom. Electrons are found in the electron cloud. Uh, just to give you an idea about what an atom looks like, the center part of the atom containing the protons and neutrons, we refer to that as the nucleus of the atom. And then here we have the outer portions. Each of these is called an orbital or an electron shell, and they contain the electrons. Overall, the whole thing is called the electron cloud. Just to review 8-man for atomic structure and Bohr models, if we were going to do a Bohr model for the element chlorine, we would look on the periodic table, and we would determine that chlorine has an atomic number of 17. So that means it would have 17 protons. That's what that means. It has 17 electrons because the positive from the proton and the negative from the electron cancel each other out in a neutral atom. With mass, uh, the mass of chlorine is 37. The atomic number, again, was 17. So what we're doing here at the last step is we subtract the atomic mass minus the number of protons, 17, or atomic number, and that gives us the number of neutrons, in this case would be 18. So here we have our protons, our neutrons, and our electrons. So we're able to now go ahead and do our Bohr model. So if I was to go ahead and draw that Bohr model for you, it would look like this. In the nucleus we have... Number of protons, 17. The nucleus all contain, also contains neutrons, so that'd be 18. And then our electron cloud, the first shell, can hold two electrons. The second shell can hold eight electrons. So now we're at 10. Last shell can hold eight electrons. We only need seven. Okay, so based on this information, we can see that chlorine does have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven valence electrons. So that makes it a reactive element. As a reminder, the mass of an atom comes from protons and neutrons, as you can see on this chart. One AMU, one AMU. So if we have 18 neutrons, plus 17 protons, that will give us 37, ooh, I made a mistake, excuse me, 20, that was a mistake, sorry, 20 neutrons, and so if you add 20 neutrons plus 17 protons, that will give you a mass of 37 AMU, 20 AMUs comes from neutrons, 17 AMUs comes from protons. So we're just basically doing this backwards. That's it for the time. Let's take a look at reactivity. Reactivity of an element is determined by valence electrons. So based on that information, we should be able to figure out the reactivity of an element if we can do a Bohr model. Atomic, uh, atomic number for potassium. Potassium is uh, 19. It's a number of protons, 19. Electrons, 19. The mass of potassium is 39. 
atomic number, 19 again, we subtract, we get 20 neutrons, 19 electrons, and 19 protons. So we can go ahead and fill that information in. And then we need 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 electrons. We need more. So we're up to a total of 18 electrons. We're going to need one more in the outer shell. So valence electrons for this would be one. Compare that to carbon. Just do that real quick. We've got six protons, six neutrons, one, two, three, four, Five, six electrons total. We've got one, two, three, four in the valence. So which is more reactive? Based on this information, one electron would be easier to lose than four electrons. So that means that sodium is more reactive. I'm sorry. Oop, not sodium. Sodium is more reactive than that as well, but we're talking about potassium here. Potassium is more reactive than carbon in this example because it has less valence electrons. Now, continuing on, we have a section of the unit that we talked about with periodic table. The periodic table is ordered by atomic number. And it groups similar elements in families or groups. So those would be the ones that go up and down from each other. An example would be like, for example, um, the alkali metals group. We have sodium, we've got potassium, and rubidium, and cesium, and francium, all in the same group. So they are all alkali metals. And they have similar properties. They're all reactive to water. They're all very highly reactive. They all have one valence electron and so on. Periods are rows on the periodic table. So they go across left and right. It would be like this. And periods don't really tell you a lot of information about an element. They're grouping elements of similar atomic number, similar mass. Um, but in terms of their properties, they tend to be very different going across a row. For example, if you go across this row here, lithium is an alkaline metal. We've got beryllium, which is an alkaline earth metal. Boron's a non-metal, 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 and noble gas. So we've got quite a few different things in that one row. Take a look at the periodic table and its kind of arrangement. This is kind of a really crappy version of the periodic table, but it does give you an idea about how it's laid out. We've got groups going up and down, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, all the way up to 18. And then we've got periods, which go across, and there are a total of seven periods on the periodic table. On the left side of the periodic table, we have our metals. And that's really, when we say the left side, we mean everything to the left of the black line, the zigzag. Over on the other side, the right side, we have our non-metals. And then along the zigzag, things like uh, silicon and astatine, tellurium, um, those are considered to be our metalloids. Just a quick reminder about those. Metals are shiny. Um, they can be bent. They're good conductors. Nonmetals, obviously the opposite. They're not good conductors. They cannot be bent. They're very brittle. If you take a piece of sulfur, for example, and you hit it with a hammer, it's just going to shatter. Um, and then it's dull, so again, opposite properties. Metalloids have properties of both metals and nonmetals. So, for example, uh, silicon is a good example because it's a good conductor of electricity and heat, but it is very brittle, so if you hit it with a hammer, it's going to break. So it's got the property of a metal and a nonmetal. Um, we've got elements grouped. Based on similarities, so here would be our alkali metals group that are highly reactive. They all have one valence electron. These are all 
fairly reactive as well because they have two valence electrons. Over on group 18, we have our noble gas group, which all noble gases have a full outer shell or a full valence, so that makes them completely non-reactive. So again, we see this trend of the periodic table is laid out in the way that it is to give us more information about elements than we already know. So taking a look at chemical changes, a chemical change versus a physical change. Chemical changes create new substances. They're also referred to as a reaction. Physical change, we have the same substance after that's done. Uh, chemical changes are hard to reverse or hard to bring back. So in other words, what we started with, it's hard to get that back. This is easy to reverse. So again, we're creating new substances. An example of a chemical change would be like burning. An example of a physical change would be like uh, dissolving. So when you burn a piece of paper or you burn a piece of wood, you end up with different substances, and therefore you can't bring the wood back. It's irreversible. It creates new substances, smoke, ash. With a physical change, like if I dissolve uh, Kool-Aid in water, I can get the Kool-Aid back by uh, evaporating all the water back out. That leaves behind the Kool-Aid. Um, you have the water and the Kool-Aid, you know they're both there. The properties have not changed. With a chemical change, you end up with new properties. They are similar because they both involve changes to matter. But they're also very different. Indicators of a chemical change. If I combine two substances, how do I know if a chemical change has occurred? Number one, production of a gas or bubbles. Like in the case of vinegar and baking soda, you'll see bubbles, obviously. Uh, number two would be color change. And we're talking about an unexpected color change. So if you combine two clear liquids and it turns purple, you don't expect that to happen. That would be evidence of a chemical change due to color change. Um, if you combine red and blue, you expect it to turn purple. So that may not be a good indicator in that example. Uh, temperature change. Whether it gets warmer or colder, when you combine two substances, like in the case of breaking an ice pack open, um, when you combine the two chemicals inside the ice pack, it does get cold. It reduces its temperature. Uh, the next one is production of light or sound. And that would be like in a case of fireworks, you have the light and the sound associated with that. When you burn things, there's light and sound associated with that as well. And last but not least, production of a precipitate, which is a fancy way of saying just a solid forming from two liquids. So if you combine two liquids and you get a solid in the bottom, that's probably telling you that that solid is a new substance you didn't have to begin with. Just uh, real quick, some non-examples of uh, chemical changes, some things that are not chemical changes, things that are physical changes that people often confuse, dissolving. Just because it disappears does not mean it is a chemical change. The substance is still there. Like, for example, if you dissolve salt in water, sugar in iced tea, the sugar is still there. You can taste it when you drink the iced tea. Um, another example would be state changes. Like, for example, boiling. Boiling produces bubbles, but those bubbles are made of the same thing that you started with. So if you're boiling water, the bubbles are water vapor, or water gas. Um, another non-example would be, um, trying to think of another, freezing, boiling, um, those are the main, really the two, we don't have to worry about the third one, the two that kids confuse the most. Okay, so chemical changes, again, create new substances. Here's how you know if you've created a new substance. Counting atoms, this is um, kind of a, going to be a super fast review. Here's a chemical formula, 3C6H12O6. The giant 3 here in front of it is called a coefficient, and that means the number of molecules. So that 3 literally means 3 molecules of C6H12O6, or glucose. The subscript is the number of atoms of each element. 
So for example, that would be six carbons, 12 hydrogen atoms, and six oxygen atoms. So in this example, we have a total of three molecules, as evident by the coefficient, that each have how many carbons? Six. How many hydrogens? Twelve. And how many oxygens? Six. So three molecules that each have six carbon, 12 hydrogen, and six oxygen atoms. If you were to figure that out in total, total carbon, we've got six times three. Six times three would be 18. When we multiply three times 12 for hydrogen, we end up with 36. And for oxygen, three times six would be 18 again. You can add those up, you're gonna get uh, 72 for the total number of atoms in three molecules of glucose, C6H12O6. If you want to find how many different elements there are, one, two, three. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are the three different elements that are found in this chemical formula. Going back up um, to the top, take this off, we've got another chemical formula here, 2H2 plus SO4. And what that means, again, two molecules that each have two hydrogen. Since there's no subscript next to sulfur, that means one sulfur and then four oxygen atoms. So there are three different elements, one, two, three, hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen. There are four hydrogens, two times two. There are two times one sulfurs, or two, and two times four oxygens, which is eight. If you add that up, 4 plus 2 plus 8 gives you 14, and there are two molecules of this substance. This would be sulfuric acid. Just to give you an idea about what that means, what does two molecules look like? If you, have, if you don't understand what a molecule is, hopefully this helps. If I wanted two molecules of water, it would look like this. 2H2O literally means 1H2O, two hydrogens, one oxygen. And here's another H2O. So we have a total of two water molecules that each have two hydrogens, one, two, one oxygen. If we were to figure out totals for that, it'd be four hydrogens, one, two, three, four, four, two times two, two times one oxygen is two oxygens. So that's it for this one. We've got one more. Let me just need to get it set up. So, let me just verify that that's still in position, and it is, okay. So, going, continuing on with chemistry, chemical equations. In order to balance a chemical equation, you have to be able to count atoms, which is what we just talked about. Chemical equations show how a chemical reaction forms a new substance. So you start with reactants on the left side of the chemical equation. On the right side of the chemical equation, to the right of the arrow, you have the products, what we end up with. So this is what we start with. And the arrow means yields, or yield, and then what we end up with is on the right side, our products. So here's an example of a chemical equation, SNO2, SN is 10, O is oxygen, plus H2, H is, of course, hydrogen, that yields SN plus H2O. So we've got 10 oxide, hydrogen, and that forms 10, and water, so again, these are new substances. That's the definition of a chemical change. So is the equation balanced or not? That's what we want to find out. And the way you would do that is you would draw a T-chart. Left side of the T-chart, reactants. Right side, products. On the left side, we've got 10, SN. We've got O, oxygen. And we've got H, hydrogen. And we count how many we have. We've got the same thing on the right side, of course. So if we want to count that, we can see that SN doesn't have a subscript, so that means one. Oxygen, we've got two. Hydrogen, two. On the right side, we've got one tin. We've got two hydrogens. 
and we've got one oxygen. So the 10 checks out, the oxygen does not check out, and the hydrogen checks out. So what this demonstrates then is that we started with two oxygens and we only ended up with one oxygen. We can't do that. That means that we've destroyed an oxygen somewhere in this reaction, which is actually impossible. The law of conservation of mass states that matter cannot be created or destroyed. It can only transform it. So where did this oxygen go? Well, we have to figure that out. That means that this reaction didn't actually go down like this. So in order to add oxygen, we would actually add coefficients to this to determine how many molecules we actually needed. So if we add a 2 here, that's going to give us our two oxygens that we needed. But now we've got 2 times 2 hydrogens, which is 4. So we can add a 2 over here. And that should theoretically balance the equation. We can verify that by, again, doing the T-chart. So same thing. We've got 110 on the reactants, 110 on the product side. For oxygen, we have 2 there. And then we have 2 times 1 here. And for hydrogen, we have 4 on the reactant side and then 4 on the product side. So the tin checks out, the oxygen checks out, and the hydrogen checks out. They they're equal on both sides of the equation. This is called a balanced equation. So at first we started with an unbalanced equation, which is sad because that means that it didn't abide by the law of conservation of mass. And then over here we have our example of a balanced equation. Let's talk a little bit about biology, food web relationships. So there are several different ways about going about looking at a uh, food web. Um, there are several different relationships that occur in a food web. Everything is kind of connected. They're interdependent. So here's an example of just a, a very basic food web. We can see that energy enters food webs through. What does it enter through? Well, energy from the sun is able to enter the food web through grass. So we don't actually normally draw this arrow, but it shows that energy is transferred from the sun to anything that is a producer, anything that's able to do photosynthesis. So through producers, they use energy from the sun by photosynthesis. So we've got three types of consumers here. We've got primary consumer, secondary, and tertiary consumer. Here's our producer, grass. That's how we get energy into the ecosystem. The grass gets eaten by mice, by rabbits, and by goats. Notice the direction of the arrow shows the flow of energy in this ecosystem. So we've got our primary consumers. They're primary because they eat a producer. Those are the only three things that eat producers. Then we've got our secondary consumer. The secondary consumer, by definition, eats a primary consumer. So literally, energy is transferred from a primary consumer to a secondary consumer. So what eats the mouse? Well, owls eat mice. Hawks eat mice. Snakes eat mice. Wild cats eat mice. Uh, and then the, for the rabbit, the rabbit gets eaten by the jackal. The goat gets eaten by the lion, so we have our secondary consumers there. Then we've got tertiary consumers. Tertiary is just the third consumer in a food chain or food web. So tertiary eats a secondary consumer. So when we said that a, an owl was a secondary consumer, there is nothing that eats it, so there is no tertiary consumer in that food web. If you were to go with the rabbit as a primary consumer, then the wild cat would be a secondary consumer, and then the lion would be a tertiary consumer, our third consumer in that food web or food chain. So it really just depends on which direction you travel or which direction you follow the food web. But obviously, the obvious relationship between a producer and a consumer is that they produce the energy and the consumer eats the energy. And the obvious relationship between a predator and a prey, like the owl and the mouse, is that the owl predates or feeds on the mouse. Um, taking a look at the food pyramid here, where is the most energy in this food pyramid? 
The most energy in a food pyramid has to be the producer level, the bottom level. If there wasn't as much energy here as there needed to be for the primary consumers, primary consumers would die. Okay, so talk a little bit about symbiosis. Symbiosis is a close relationship between two organisms and an ecosystem. So three examples of symbiotic, symbiotic relationships would be parasitism, commensalism, and mutualism. Those are the three types. Parasitism, one organism benefits. That's called the parasite. One organism is hurt. That's called the host. And usually in a parasite-host relationship, the parasite lives on the host. An example would be like, for example, a flea on a dog. The flea benefits because it gets energy from the dog. The dog does not benefit, it gets hurt. And the reason is because it's losing blood. Commensalism is a little bit different. One organism benefits in a commensalistic relationship, and one organism is completely unaffected. They don't care. It doesn't help, it doesn't hurt them. An example would be like, for example, a bird and an alligator. Everybody's probably heard the story of the bird eating or picking the, the food out of the alligator's teeth. The alligator doesn't care if it loses that food because it's getting plenty. The bird, on the other hand, benefits because it's able to get food. So, again, this one benefits, that one doesn't care. Or another example would be birds picking bugs off of uh, bison or cattle or something like that. The cattle won't really care if the bird picks the bugs off of them. Uh, another example would be mutualism. Another type of symbiotic relationship. In a mutualistic relationship, one organism benefits, and the other organism also benefits. It's mutually beneficial. Mutual being the key word there. An example would be the clownfish and the anemone. So, for example, the clownfish and the anemone, the clownfish get protection from predators because they're able to live inside the anemone. The anemone actually stings things that pursue the clownfish. So other things other than the clownfish don't go in there. The anemone, on the other hand, is able to filter feed some of the food that's off of the clownfish, and the clownfish also kind of keeps the anemone clean. So clownfish gets protection, the anemone stays clean and gets a little bit of energy um, as well from the clownfish. Competition is two or more substance, uh, organisms competing for the same resources in an area. So there are two types of resources they could be competing for. Biotic, which is a living or once was living, and then abiotic, which is not living, never was. So some examples of those would be, biotic would be like food. That's the main one. Could also consider mates to be a biotic factor that they uh, compete for. Um, if we're talking about this... Of course, we'd be looking at the food web to determine what are they competing for. Um, abiotic factors, non-living, we won't see those on food webs. Examples would be like water, shelter, light, in the case of plants, uh, space, in the case of plants and animals. Let's see, did I miss anything? Soil, in some cases, or nutrients from the soil, in the case of plants. So here we have a, a, another basic food web. It's a little bit easier than the last one. Which organisms compete in this one? Well, if you take a look, two organisms eat the same food source. So the owl and the snake both eat the mouse. So they are in competition with each other. And how does it affect the food web if we have population changes? Well, if these guys are in competition with each other, First of all, that's going to hurt them because it's not going to allow them to reproduce as much. There will be less snakes because some snakes are starving. And why are they starving? Because there's less mice because there's owls. If we, for example, have an increase in the snake population, then what will happen to the mouse population? The mouse population will decrease because there's more mice being eaten. If that's true, if there's less mice, then that means we'll also have an effect on owls. So the owl's population would decrease because there's less food available for them. If that's true, if mice decrease, then that means that possibly grass populations will increase, which means we might see an increase in rabbit populations. And if there's more snakes, then that means there could be more hawks because hawks eat snakes. 
So we can see that when one population within an ecosystem changes due to competition or due to a change or, or whatever the environment, there's going to be changes across the board. If we were to swap that and say the mice population increased, then we would see an increase in the population of the snakes and a decrease, I'm sorry, an increase in the population of hawks, increase in the population of owls. What if we decrease the population of snakes? Less competition now, so that means more mice, so that means more owls. So again, everything in the food web is connected. So about natural selection. Natural selection is when an organism with traits best suited for survival, also known as adaptations, will be more likely to survive and reproduce. So it's pretty easy to see here. We've got environment one and environment two. And these are supposed to be moths. I know they're kind of bad, but the point is still, still valid. Which type of moth is easier for predators to find and eat in each, in each environment? Well, in environment one, we can see that the brown moths stick out more. The reason is because the environment is white. So if I was a predator, I would probably be more likely to see one of these guys than I would be one of those. So what happens to the population of brown moths? Well, it's going to decrease. And if there's less brown moths because they're being eaten, then that means they don't make babies. They're not able to reproduce. If you talk about the white moths in this scenario, if they're able to survive better because they're camouflaged and they blend in with the surroundings, with their environment, then they're not being eaten as much, so they have more babies. And so over time, what we will see then is an increase in the population of white moths and a decrease in the population of brown moths. If you look at environment two, if the environment changed for some reason, then we're going to see the exact opposite happen. The white moths are now easy to find by predators, and so they get eaten a lot, so they have less babies, which means their population decreases. If you look at the brown moths, they're a little bit harder to see, so predators can't find them as easy, so their population increases, they're able to make babies and survive better. So again, we're talking about the ability of an organism to survive and make babies or, make, or reproduce. Other examples of adaptations, things that can help an organism survive and make babies, Thick fur, camouflage, good vision, claws, teeth, special beaks in the case of birds. You could go on and on about antibiotic resistance and bacteria. And so Let's talk about ocean interactions now. Humans interact with oceans, and we can have positive and negative effects on those ocean systems. So those would be overfishing. If we fish too much, that means there's less fish in the sea. They can't make babies. They can't reproduce, which means... We're damaging those ecosystems, and over time, we're going to have a less food supply. Another example would be uh, ranching or fertilizers. And we'll talk a little bit about runoff and how those get to the ocean, but basically the, the chemicals in fertilizers, and when we're talking about cattle being in, they have a lot of waste products, specifically feces or urine. All of those chemicals end up getting washed into the ocean, which does degrade the quality of the water. Number three would be uh, oil spills. Oil, obviously, we've seen the big deal with BP recently and how that affected our ocean. Another one would be plastics and trash, just basic pollutants. And we all know pretty much what that does. Some organisms can mistake these for food and eat them, and, of course, they die. Number five would be destruction of reefs. And I actually left off one. So reefs are basically a place for fish to live um, and organisms in the ocean to live. And they're able to survive a little bit better if they have a home. They're not in the, out in the middle of the ocean to be eaten by larger fish. So that promotes an increase in population of fish. The last one would be artificial reefs, which humans put in the ocean to try and increase population of fish to give them a place so that they can live and reproduce. So this is, a, this is really the only good thing out of that that we see. Uh, at the bottom, we're talking a little bit about runoff. This relates to this and to this. So these chemicals that we use all the time, and really this, chemicals that we use in fertilizers and the chemicals in urine and feces, um, our trash, 
anything that we put into the ground can undergo a process called runoff. And the runoff is when chemicals and pollutants get washed into bodies of water by rain. So what that does then is, as you can see, I kind of drew a little picture. It's not very good, but water flows downhill. So when it rains, it's going to take anything that it gets in contact with with it. So if it's oil or if it's cow poop or if it's um, fertilizers, chemicals and fertilizers, all of that's going to get washed into whatever body of water it drains in. And ultimately, a lot of that ends up in the ocean. So we can see that's pretty easy to see um, why that's an issue. All those chemicals end up in a body of water, and that can affect populations and really the quality of water in that area.